Hello, my name is Patrick Woodhead and I'm a technical program manager at Protocol Labs and we are talking today about uh, Filecoin retrieval market. Um, the agenda is we're going to begin with some motivation, not that we need any motivating for everyone listening in to Filecoin Orbit because I'm sure everyone is super excited about all the amazing presentations they've seen so far. But we're going to motivate the topic of retrieval markets. We're then going to have um, an ecosystem spotlight with one of the really exciting teams in our ecosystem um, for retrieval markets, Mile. And then for the second half, we're going to have a Q&A with Mile um, and find out uh, yeah, what they've been up to and their thoughts on retrieval markets in general. So we begin with the motivation. The internet is like a road network with traffic jams and crowded roads. Um, in a road network, let's say, let's take Amazon Books, for example, uh, they have distribution centers all around the world and so that they can deliver books to people who have ordered them online as quickly as possible. And the same can be said for the internet. And the way that the internet provides files around the world so they can be retrieved very quickly is by something which is called a CDN, a content delivery network. And CDNs have these data servers around the world, which are called points of presence or POPs. Um, the, the household names for those in the know in the CDN space is AWS CloudFront, uh, Cloudflare, Akamai, Fastly. And they achieve an average of around 25 milliseconds for a retrieval around the, glo around the globe. Um, we'll see some stats on the next slide. Um, I also want to mention here that Web2 or traditional cloud providers, they separate file storage pricing from file retrieval pricing. So you pay to store your files in Amazon S3, and then you pay also to retrieve files from Amazon S3. And then you may pay on top of that for the CDN layer. So how do CDNs perform around the world? Um, CDNs uh, globally on the left-hand side, you can see Azure at the top has an average query speed of 22 milliseconds for you to retrieve a file from one of their CDN points of presence. Um, but you know that's a very, very condensed metric. On the right-hand side, we have performance in Africa, uh, where we can see that the retrieval times for the CDNs is, is much slower, more than twice as slow for the top provider. And this data is from cdnperf.com. And even here, I think we've condensed the data quite a lot because they're optimized to perform in cities, uh, but in more sparsely populated regions uh, and territories, uh, it, it can take much, much longer for users to retrieve their data. And here, in fact, we've got a list, list of countries that don't have a single point of presence for one of these uh, Web2 CDM providers. And lots of them are small islands, so perhaps it's not particularly necessary. They can fetch their data uh, in a performant time from, from next door countries. But there are also some pretty big land masses here. We've got, uh, for example, the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. We've got Greenland. We've got the Central African Republic, Sudan. These are big land masses. Uh, without a single CDM POP. And that makes us ask the question, why, why have they not got one of these CDM points of presence? And it's, uh, I imagine, to do with the business model. It doesn't make sense for these companies to build a data center there, to build a power supply to these countries, um, and to, you know, to offer this service when there isn't the, the appetite. So we've spoken about the, ge the geographic um, issues, I suppose, with, with Web2 CDMs. Um, I'm now going to speak a bit about the um, the market, the pricing of, of um, retrieving data from, in this case, Amazon S3. And this uh, this slide is taken from a blog from Cloudflare called AWS Egregious Egress, which is a, a great name. Um, and they estimate with their calculations that customers in US, Canada, and Europe who are retrieving files from S3 are paying an 8,000% markup uh, to retrieve their data, so 80 times what it costs Amazon to put on that service of retrie of retrieving that file um, is what they're if, what you're paying to retrieve, which is a huge markup. So yeah, we've spoken about the the geographic issues, some of the pricing issues, um, and that brings us on to retrieval markets. What is the vision? So the vision for the Falcon retrieval market is to build the world's best CDN by leveraging Web three technologies. The first part of this vision is just to build the Web3 CDN. It's a fundamental building block of Web3. And if we can provide this service so that DAP developers uh, can, can have a CDN in the Web3 stack, and it can be the same sort of retrieval times and price as a Web2 CDN, then that's a huge win. Um, but then can we go one step further? Because actually, Web3 properties and constructs may allow us to outperform traditional CDNs in certain ways. Um, 
For example, the content addressable nature of, of data uh, on Filecoin uh, means that uh, firstly, these point of presence won't, ha won't have to worry about kind of deduplication of data. They can just store the file once and uh, not multiple times. And we also don't have to worry about cache and validation. If data be becomes stale, we, we know because it's been updated and it's a new CID. So we're getting a lot of, you know, by, by the kind of nature of content addressable data, we're getting a lot of stuff for free, which is actually really useful uh, for a CDN. Um, we also, it's permissionless. So anyone should be able to spin up one of these points of presence in the Web3 CDN. Um, and incentivized by by crypto economic mechanisms, uh, they can they can earn coin, um, and they may even be able to, to mine coin uh, as one of these points of presence. And that means that we, yeah, if, we if anyone remembers the fastly outage back in June of this year, where vast swathes of the of the internet went offline uh, because of a CDN going down, this won't be a problem anymore because we've got a, a much more uh, distributed network, uh, a lot of points of presence from whom we can fetch the data. And then also smart redistribution of content. Um, points of presence, there's a really low barrier to entry to spin up a point of presence. So if there's a market, people can spin one up, they can start serving files, and they can start to understand where data is being requested. And it's much more kind of dynamic than the kind of static, uh, more hub and spoke approach of the Web2 graph, as you can see in these pictures. So I hope I've set the scene for for um, retrieval markets. Uh, it's about uh, this, this Web3 CDN and how we can incentivize people to become points of presence in the network. Um, and the work we're doing at Protocol Labs on the retrieval markets is actually a real ecosystem focused uh, work, yeah, work stream. So we've got so many amazing teams in the ecosystem all contributing, and one of which is Mile. And we have um, Alex and Tomah from, from Mile here to speak to us today. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to, to them. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, for that uh, great introduction. And thank you, Valcoin, for having us. Uh, so as Patrick mentioned, I'm Alexander Cabuto, co-founder and CEO of Mile. So very succinctly, Mile is a content delivery network that is resilient, scalable, and peer-to-peer -to, -peer to suit the long-term needs of Web3 applications. So as a member of the Valcoin community, why should you care about us? Well. We're building the CDN on Filecoin, and we're bringing in new capabilities to the ecosystem. So a CDN and retrieval market like ours can really accelerate retrieval from storage miners, and by doing so, can extend Filecoin's capabilities beyond cold storage uh, to hot storage and caching as well. Um, and secondly, because the requirements for running a retrieval miner are much less uh, than a storage miner, we're also lowering the barrier to entry to become a, no uh, a node on the Filecoin network and to earn fill. Um, but, you know, DCDNs like ours have benefits beyond accelerating retrieval from decentralized cold storage. Uh, we're really developing interfaces that allow anyone to easily extend our CDN by spinning up a new node in an instant. And what we're aiming for is for this ease of use to create a distributed network of caches with no single point of failure and where the cost of adding a new node is close to zero dollars. And we're really aiming to bring content as close as possible to end users for maximum performance uh, by way of this network. And at the core of what we're building is the Golang interface of the mile, what we're calling pop nodes for a point of presence. Uh, so these are the independent caches that can host and serve content to requesting clients. And this interface is currently pretty simple and allows for four operations which are content dispatching, uh, whereby a node can ask other peers to cache content for it. Uh, content discovery, a node can search for specific content. Content delivery, uh, a node can serve content that they have cached to a requesting content. And payments, uh, whereby a node can pay another node and fill for delivering content. So on their own, these operations are really simple, uh, but you can kind of compose them and coordinate them across the network to create more complex capabilities. But paired with these pop nodes, you know, we've also released an in-browser client, uh, which is just a JavaScript implementation of a pop node, uh, which makes it really easy for Web3 developers to cache and fetch content from our network. And this client has a few really impressive features. 
Um, the first is that it doesn't rely on centralized gateways to retrieve content. So it enables a pure peer-to-peer -peer connection between a browser and a pop node. And this is kind of a rare feature in the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, space. And the second is that we've enabled sponsored crypto payments, whereby an app developer or a company can sponsor and pay for their users' payments when they retrieve content. So we have an early version of this client running up on our website at mile.network. Um, try it out and reach out if you want to contribute. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, intro, guys. Um, and yeah, I'd like to begin by just saying it's been yeah a pleasure kind of starting to work together recently, hearing more about what you've been up to at Mile um, and seeing the really nice UIs that, that you've built, firstly, for your for your website and for, for your products. So it always makes it easy to get into uh, into, into the products when you can look at it. It looks nice in the first place. Um, so, yeah. First question I'd like to ask is just kind of speaking generally, we've, we've touched on this a bit already, but why do you think we need a, a Web3 CDN? Yeah, I mean, a, a very fair question. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, centralized CDNs kind of serve their current purpose really well in the areas that they are. Um, you know, they deliver content in a really reliable fashion. Um, I think some of them serve trillions of requests a day. Uh, so nothing really to spit at in terms of performance. Um, but the problems that we foresee are twofold, and you kind of touched on this. Um, the first is that, you know, these CDNs kind of serve the, the world unevenly, and they haven't really expanded beyond big population centers in, you know, the U.S., the EU, and Asia, uh, because it, re it really isn't profitable for them to do so. Um, and the second is that because of the management of this infrastructure is super centralized, uh, when it fails, it fails very, very visibly. Um, as you mentioned with the, the Fastly downtime in, in June. Um, and in our quest to kind of make the, the web ever more reliable, um, we should kind of aspire to reduce the risk of these kinds of failure. Um, and it's really our thesis that a decentralized CDN can kind of supplement existing CDNs by you know, providing a dense network of content delivery points that can expand to where existing CDNs can't go. They can do so at a really low cost. Um, and because they don't have a single point of failure, they can provide a more reliable baseline, basically, for content delivery. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I, I love the idea of the kind of zero cost to spin up a, a pop node, um, and the idea that you know you it could be on someone's phone or, or or laptop. You know, these are just supercomputers that people are carrying around, so that the network becomes much more dynamic and okay, yeah, low barrier to entry. Um, so you've also spoken a bit about this, but would you be able to go into a bit more detail about um, what Mile are currently focused on? Um, what's kind of what's interesting you at the moment? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, something that we touched upon towards the end, and I think Thomas can uh, can kind of expand on, is that we're really trying to make the developer experience of using the network as easy as possible. And part of that, you know, is enabling browser-based retrievals. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we've, we've been working on uh, kind of making it easy to run clients in the browser uh, so that it doesn't really disrupt the regular uh, front end experience on how you would normally build your, your UI and, you know, consumer content. And um, we've actually had two options uh, available now. One of them is running the, the client into a service worker. So you essentially acting as a proxy. So you just make normal HTTP requests as if you were targeting an, an IPFS gateway, for example. Uh, and then the node that's running in a different worker, in a different thread, is essentially in the background, uh, will kind of uh, intercept those requests and then find the provider and then make those requests immediately. So you actually don't need to um, hit any gateway or anything like that, and you're really running uh, a, a node inside of the browser. Uh, and then uh, for those who don't want to add, for example, a service worker, because it still, you know, adds a little bit of, um, you know, down, down, download time on the initial uh, load time, for example, or others who don't want to use this. Uh, we're also kind of running those clients inside of Cloudflare workers. So it's kind of uh, an intermediary where it's already running on the edge and can already find very close nodes from there. Uh, so 
you know, it's as if you would request as, as well normal HTTP requests, but then you, you just spin up a, a, a client node in the, in the browser, uh, sorry, in on the Cloudflare edge really quickly. So that's also something we're using to make it easier, but still, you know, quite decentralized um, to, to query content from our network. Awesome, thanks so much. It's, it's nice to go into a few more of the kind of technical details there as well, just to give people a flavor of what this is really about. Um, so I know that uh, you've been traveling the world recently, um, looking to, to deploy pops, pop nodes around the place. Um, so my next question is, who wants to use this? Uh, who, who do you find are your users? Who, who's interested? What, what sort of yeah, categories of, of users are you, are you looking at? Yeah, so the at the moment, the, the people that have expressed the most interest, or I, I shouldn't say people, I should say organizations, are, are really, you know, <laughs> deeply crypto-native organizations like DAOs uh, who have, you know, community treasuries and cryptocurrency, and they need to be able to deploy those funds to then, uh, you know, um, buy out infrastructure, basically, whether it's origin servers or CDNs. Um, and because, you know, everything we do is, uh, is essentially enabled by crypto payments, we're a great fit for those sorts of organizations who want to function autonomously and leverage that those their treasuries basically to hire out infrastructure. Um, on the decentralized app end, obviously NFTs really content heavy. Um, you know, NFT platforms really content heavy, uh, want to be able to serve content like videos in a timely fashion obviously want a decentralized CDN um, and they're already using IPFS in the back end because we're kind of interoperable with that. We're a natural fit for them. Um, but we're also seeing some interest from, you know, the centralized CDNs who are, I, we know there's some initiatives internally to kind of explore IPFS and other peer-to-peer -peer technologies and as an extension of what they already have. Yeah. And to, Add to that as well. I think we've been doing also a lot of research uh, into who is running the points of presence and um, you know what the experience should look like because you know it's not we're not looking at a different way where people are going to build server farms and that's in that sense we're really looking at you know who are users inside of urban environments or you know people with regular laptops what that experience is going to look like for them to run those nodes are they going to trust to you know to download some third party software see what ends up on the devices so we're also doing a lot of uh, user research on that front to really understand what it will take uh, to deploy all the pops at the edge um, to a very very large audience awesome thanks um so yeah, next question is looking forward. Um, what are the biggest question marks um, around kind of where this is going, the, the research that you've, that's got to be done? Um, what keeps you up at night? Uh, but yeah, for, <laughs> for how this progresses. Well, yeah, a few things. Um, but I, <laughs> as, as Tova mentioned, um, the longer term vision obviously is one where you know, the, the network and the nodes are as distributed as possible and you want to bring it as close as possible to end users because what's really key in content delivery, like physical distance is actually kind of king in, in performance in this space. If you get content as close as possible to your end users, um, you know, <laughs> so ba basically all of that to say that building this very distributed network with lots of nodes is going to require like, fine-tuned and very carefully considered crypto economic incentives um, to incentivize people to serve uh, content on the network. So making sure that they're getting paid uh, an amount and uh, whereby they would basically contribute excess resources to the network is something that we're, we're actively working on and researching. Um, but we're also looking at leveraging potentially like non-economic incentives. Obviously, this is a bit of a softer topic, but if you're a user who wants to contribute to a decentralized application that you really care about, maybe there's incentives already there for you to contribute your, your excess storage to cash, you know, some of the web assets for the applications that you already care about. So kind of balancing those two incentives, you know, the softer <laughs> incentives with the crypto economic ones is something that we're, we're looking into for sure. And as well, I think we're really looking at how to scale uh, the payment infrastructure, you know, and looking at what it's going to take to get to 
you know, the highest speed possible and still have be able to handle all those micro micro payments, um, you know, on the Falcon blockchain. Uh, so that's definitely something we're, we're also researching actively at the moment. Uh, but we're confident there are solutions out there. Uh, and there's other groups looking, you know, on the actor side uh, to improve the performance and the user experience around payment and state channels on Falcoin. So we're definitely actively uh, testing these and looking at what is needed uh, to, to get to that. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I, I know the work you're alluding to, and it's uh, very exciting some of these other things happening in the ecosystem. Um, so final question. Um, what would you recommend to other teams who are looking to get into this retrieval market space? Um, yeah, we want to build the ecosystem. We want more teams to to get interested, to get involved. Because there's so many different pro uh, you know problems we can solve. So, what would you recommend? I I think you know everyone should come introduce themselves in in the retrieval market channel on the Falcon Slack first you know, first off you know, um, and then really kind of look at. And, and, you know, obviously start a conversation and look at where the holes are because there's still some gaps. And I think it's really important to figure out what people are not working on and just kind of fill those gaps uh, so that we don't duplicate the work. And so, yeah, really communicating on what's interesting, what are your strengths and figure out, you know, where is your place in the ecosystem. And that's kind of what we've been looking at and collaborating with other teams and figuring out how we can all, you know, leverage each other's building blocks. Um, and then, you know, help each other when you're stuck. That's also pretty useful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I guess for, for context, there's, there are other teams working on the retrieval market problem and we're all kind of tackling different aspects of it. So there's a, yeah, there's a great community feel. I mean, obviously there's some outstanding problems with all these teams that we can all help direct, direct you to, to like problems that need solving. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. Um, it's really exciting the work that you're doing. I'm really excited to see where it heads. Um, I can also see some people coming up next from the ecosystem to speak. So, uh, yeah, it's just the ecosystem around retrieval markets is really exciting. If anyone does want to get involved, head to retrieval.market. It's that easy to remember. It's just, a, you know, put it into your URL bar and, and press enter. And from there, you should be able to find anything you need to get involved. Thanks very much.